We have seen that research results from a variety of fields, such as physics, experimental mathematics, and artificial life, all suggest that complex self-organized systems can arise and exist only at the boundary between order and chaos. These systems require a fine balance between isolation and participation in their environment. As Langton says, complex self-organized systems are a phase transition phenomenon. But the phase transition analogy points to a fundamental problem. Phase transitions are typically very transient. Ice, for example, melts quickly when the temperature rises above freezing. To maintain water in its phase transition, the temperature must be held just at the freezing point. This is where many crystallizing phenomena appear. So, how do complex self-organized systems maintain themselves just at the phase transition between order and disorder, when environmental conditions are constantly changing? In other words, when the world shifts, why doesn't the system lose its balance and fall, like Humpty Dumpty? Why doesn't it settle into either chaotic disorder or simple dead order? That is the question that Stuart Kaufman and others have tried to answer. Kaufman, who began his career as a medical researcher, was one of the first to adopt an abstract computational approach to understanding human physiology. Kaufman has tried to separate the logical structure of the human machine from its material basis of construction, just as von Neumann had done with computers. At one level, there is a straightforward answer to why systems don't settle into either order or disorder. This answer is that the systems evolve. For example, throughout geologic time, as climates have changed, local ecosystems and the species composing them have evolved by responding to the new conditions. Of course, some species fail to evolve and they disappear. But at a deeper level, the problem remains. What properties must a system have if it is to evolve? The answer is far from obvious, and evolvability has emerged as one of the fundamental questions in the study of complex self-organized systems. Kaufman states the problem this way. What kinds of dynamical systems have the capacity to accumulate useful variations, hence evolve and co-evolve. How do such systems interact with their worlds in the sense of categorizing their worlds, acting upon those categorizations and evolving as their worlds with other players themselves evolve? No one knows. But Kaufman has begun to find out, and he has asked, what are the conditions that allow a system or organism to mutate successfully. Biologists have not thought through the implications of the fact that natural selection operates on systems which exhibit spontaneous order. The Darwinian paradigm presumes that adapting organisms can accumulate useful mutations. Yet we must ask what the preconditions are for such capacities. For some classes of systems are better able to adapt than others. Indeed, some systems can hardly accumulate useful variations at all. Kaufman points out that evolutionary adaptation is more concerned with local conditions than with global ones. In other words, evolution is concerned with specific adaptation, and this affects global conditions only in a long-term way. As Francis Jacob pointed out in his 1977 essay, Evolution and Tinkering, adaptation typically progresses through small changes involving a local search procedure in the space of possibilities. The paradigm is one of local hill climbing via fitter mutants towards some local or global optimum. Like others working in this field, Kaufman uses the metaphor of the fitness landscape. In this metaphor, a movement to a higher elevation symbolizes evolution to greater fitness. Kaufman finds that if the fitness landscape is too smooth, if the hills are low and gentle, then evolution is difficult. 
because there's not much difference in fitness among locations. On the other hand, if the landscape is too rough, evolution is again difficult because the peaks, although high, are difficult to reach. To get to a peak, it may be necessary to go down, to cross valleys and gorges of low fitness. But can the population survive these periods of low fitness? In this framework, adaptive evolution in the population is a hill-climbing process. The population can be thought of as a cluster of individuals located at different points in the landscape. Mutations move an individual or its offspring to neighboring points in the space representing neighboring genotypes. Selection is reflected in differential reproduction by individuals with different fitness. Therefore, over time, the cluster of individuals representing the population will flow over the fitness landscape. It is intuitive from this description that the behavior of an adapting population depends upon how mountainous the fitness landscape is, on how large the population is, and on the mutation rate which moves an individual in the space. The tricky part of this landscape metaphor is that the landscape itself is partially determined by the thing that's climbing the hills. It's as though the mountaineer created the mountain by the very act of climbing it. Remember that Kaufman, though he comes to this work as a medical researcher, is not studying evolution just in our ecosystem, or merely in life as we know it. He is searching for general principles of evolvability that would apply to any evolvable system. So rather than working with fruit flies, as many evolutionary biologists do, he turns to experimental mathematics. He works with things called Boolean networks, which are abstract structures similar to cellular automata. Based on his work with Boolean networks, Kaufman speculates that if systems work together and evolve in tandem, they might develop more ways to live near a phase transition, which enables even greater complexity and chaos. Using our earlier example of ice, these systems would exist in a partially frozen and partially liquid state. If we could find natural ways to model co-evolution among Boolean networks, which received inputs from one another and external worlds, we would find that such systems tuned their internal structures and couplings to one another so as to optimize something like their evolvability. An intuitive bet is that such systems would achieve internal structures in which the frozen components were nearly melted. Such structures live on the edge of chaos, in the liquid interface suggested by Langton, where complex computation can be achieved. So we see here the same phase transition phenomenon. It seems that the same qualities that permit self-organization also permit evolvability. Evolvability, in turn, permits these systems to retain their capacity for self-organization in spite of changing conditions. <laughs>